Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Pastor Greg's Bible study is in Matthew chapter 28, titled, Purposeful Belonging, Part 4, Connections. We'll begin our time by uh, <clears throat> recapping the Great Commission here in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. So all, all, we're trying to, I got it, I didn't know you were here, uh, in here, okay. So we're going to begin our time by reading Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, the, the, known as the Great Commission. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Can you think of a better passage that point that 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 condenses what our mission is? I mean, there's a lot of good passages. Hopefully, come to your mind that that, that drive you, that, that that make you want to move and do things. But but there's there's no more concise passage than than the Great Commission to say this is what life is about. This is what we are here for. And so tonight we're going to talk about how being a me meaningful member of the body of Christ means that we are connected. There has to be some connection. You can't be, uh, you can't be a rogue, all by yourself person and fulfill the ministry that God has for us. And I don't think anybody thinks that you, that you can, but sometimes we act that way. So how do we connect well, first of all, first of all, we're going to connect upward. We need to connect with God. That's the that's the first and most important part. So we have to make sure that we're connected fully as best we can to our God. Now, on, on that walk, there's always going to be more. You can feel more connected, but we need to be fully connected. We've talked about what that takes. It takes uh, it takes a com commitment to understanding who Christ is. But once we're once we're there, we see Jesus for who He is, as and He's our Savior and He's our Lord. What happens then is that uh, <clears throat> we ha need to continue that walk with Him. And so the upward connection, in number one, it says, "I will seek purity in my life." I will seek purity in my life. When we come to know Christ. It's because of what he did on the cross. And what he did on the cross was for one purpose, and that was so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be clean and we could be pure. Because only the clean and pure get into heaven. And that's not you, naturally, and that's not me, naturally. And we're just, we're just out of luck, if you like, if, if, I hate to use the word luck, but we're just out of luck if it means we got to clean ourselves up because it's not going to happen it can't happen but we're striving now for purity we're seeking purity because we understand how important it is that Jesus died to take away sins and we don't want to walk in those same sins we don't want to walk in new sins we don't want to walk in anything that that would dishonor what he did for us so how do we walk in purity we walk by obeying the word at some point in our walk with Christ, we also come to the conclusion that the, the Word of God is real and you can't add to it, you can't take away from it. But the Word of God is going to give us purity because it's going to wash us. John chapter 17, which is the main passage for tonight, Jesus prays for all the people who will believe after He's gone, after He's done His work. And this is the beginning of that, that passage in John chapter 17, verse 6. And following, uh, he says, I've revealed to you those whom you gave me out of this world. He's talking to the Father. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. For I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified, sanctified being completely cleaned and washed and made right. And so the purity connection means we're going to connect to God through purity and the truth of the matter is that we can't make a connection to God if we disregard purity. Because when we, when we sin, sin always complicates things. Sin breaks our relationship with God. And we can't really do the things that God's called us to do unless we continue to seek purity. So we'll obey the word. And secondly, we, we need to seek purity in our walk. 
in my walk. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. What is the walk? What is the walk? It's, it's the way you live. It's, it's pretty much all that you do in your, the, the way you live as an example of, of a saved person. And you're, you should walk in purity means there's certain places you shouldn't walk. And along with that work, walk, we're going to talk about some other parts of that in a minute. But your walk should be with the things of the Lord and on the purposes of the Lord. Uh, we need to seek purity in my witness. Let your shine, light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We need to seek purity in our witness. If we're going to affect those around us who have yet to know Christ, and we're going to bring our little circle of influence into them, we sure as the world better look different than the world. Or I should more accurately say we sure should, sure as heaven, <laughs> uh, look different than the world. When we interact, when, when we intersect, we need to have this purity about <clears throat> our walk and therefore our witness the things we say, and that's the next one, in our words, in our words. In my words, I need to seek purity. I've encountered a lot of people <clears throat> who come to Christ, and their heart gets cleansed, but their, their tongue takes a little while longer. And uh, if you know, you know the book of James, it's like, if you think you're going to tame the tongue easily, that's not how it's going to be. It's... Anybody who can tame his tongue, James says, <clears throat> is a perfect man because nobody's perfect. And But we need to be pure in our words, the way we say things. And I'm going to quote, not this version that's listed for you in the NIV. My favorite version is the uh, New Century version on this particular passage. It says, when you talk, do not say harmful things, but say what people need, words that help others become stronger. So all of a sudden, we have some... We have, in our pure, striving for purity, we have some filters that are straight from the Bible. When you talk, and you will talk, when you talk, first of all, don't say harmful things, which means you got to think about what you're saying before you say it. Will this hurt people? Will this dishonor God? What are the passages that keep me from saying this? And you're going to find... That there are a lot of things that the Lord's going to hinder you from if you walk in His Spirit from saying. Uh, I know uh, Kim's, their Sunday school class had a, I think I might have mentioned this last week, but their, their passage was when, memory passage was, when words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. And so we have to seek purity in our words. Just because it honors God is great. And that's the, should be the number one priority. But also because everything's in light of the Great Commission. When we go off course, nobody expects us to be perfect. But, but if we're trying to bring the gospel into people's life and close to their lives, we need to be able to live it in a way that is extremely different from other people. So purity in the body, purity in yourself, is the focus of, of a meaningful relationship, a meaningful connection with God. So we're, we're connecting upward, but we're also connecting inward. And the inward not meaning inward to yourself, but inward to the church body. Roman numeral two. I will strive for unity in my church. Strive for unity in my church. You know, we say, we, one of the songs that we sing, one of our welcome songs in the late service is Stand Strong. Stand Strong, the words, maybe you know them, maybe you don't. Stand Strong, Stand Together about, around the Word of the Lord. We're one in doctrine, which is teaching. We're one in, one in love, in the love of Christ. Striving for purity. We talked about purity. And now we move from purity to unity. We have to walk together. And we become one unit Continue our, our John chapter 17 passage. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Remember, Jesus is praying this for you and me. Everyone who's going to believe after he goes back to heaven. I've given them the glory that you gave me. 
that they may be one as we are one. So we're supposed to have unity in the same way that the Trinity has unity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working in tandem, not against each other, always with each other. I and them and you and me, may, may they be brought completely in unity. May, may they be brought to complete unity. Let the world know that you sent me and I've loved them even as you have loved me. Getting along. A lot of people can get along for a while. Right? But it's hard to get along for a long time. It's hard to get along and you're going to see the world getting along for a little bit and then they write people off and in the church it should be different and we do this by having a unity around God and the next blank is there by loving God how do we have unity in our church we uniquely and together love God we like to gather around our our interests so we have a lot of varied interests in this room what what it Aside, aside, don't give me a spiritual answer like Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. But outside of the church, which, which is always, I'm sure, is your number one prime passion for every part of your life. Outside of that, what do you love to do? I want to hear just some, some ideas. What do, you, what do you just love to do? Spend the day at the beach. Day at the beach. There you go. Wing foil. Say again, someone? Foil. Wing foil. Wing foil, all right. Fishing. Fishing. I, I knew someone would come up with that one. Photography, all right. There you go. Walking my dog. And we, and we have common interests. You know, when we bump into people and we have something in common, it's really cool, right? And you have that one thing in common. And if that one thing is, <clears throat> is one of these things, you can, build, you can build a pretty good relationship out of that one thing. So if we, if we go from the big, big things in our life and we start replacing this with things that you like to do, then your life intersects with other people in the same way. The things that we like. None of those things you mentioned are good or bad. They're certainly not sinful or not sinful. They don't honor God or dishonor God. The way you do them could. If you love, uh, if you love your sport or your things so much that you don't do the things you find in God's word, then that's bad. But none of these things are bad. And as we intersect with people... Uh, we find these commonalities and we build that relationship. And in church, the difference is that we love God. And while there are different aspects and, and ways to disagree on a lot of things uh, in the secular world, whether it's golfing or fishing or uh, kiteboarding or bowling or whatever your interest is, and you can go different ways, if you believe the, the God of the Bible, you'll always have unity around Him. So we have unity by loving God, and then we have, you know the next blank, by loving others. Um, he's given us that love, and we're supposed to share it out. Love your neighbor, Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. 39. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then in John 13, 34, Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. And by this, this loving one another part, by this, all men will know, and there's a typographical error right there, really bad. They will know that your disciples, you are just my disciples, if you love one another. If you love one another, it's different. And when times of trouble, we don't break the unity because we love God and we love each other and so unity is our foundation we build we we build have the start on purity we want to be like god we want to do the things he says we want to obey his commandments and that narrows our field and then we have this foundation in unity but here's a problem with unity is it is it unity at all costs no the answer is no we're supposed to be people of unity but we're in unity around the scriptures around who God is, around what God says. Because very often what can happen is um, the loudest person, the meanest person, can, can, can veto where a church is going. They can veto spiritual things just because nobody wants to deal with them. And we're not, we're not like that. We're not doing that. 
And we haven't really bumped up against that a lot. But our principle is that, that nobody's going to hijack what we got going to keep us away from the scriptures. Everything's coming back to the Bible. Everything's coming back to the Word of God. Everything is going to be focused right back there. And we're not going to allow, allow the loudest or the meanest or the most conniving person to get us off track. So unity does never trumps our doctrine, never trumps our teaching, and it never trumps us trying to be pure. And, and I, I've, I've used these words before, and, uh, you know, sometimes people are so passionate about a thing or a task accomplishing this thing that they will lie, cheat, steal, and burn your house down so they can do this thing because this is what God wants for us. And we're not like that. God's people are in unity around Christ, and there's so many things that really, really don't matter. You want to find out what matters? Talk to somebody at the end of their life on their deathbed. Find out what really matters. And not just one. You can talk to a whole bunch of them and they're going to go, well, you know, a lot of what I did really didn't matter. A lot of stuff I got in a tizzy over really didn't matter. And in the church, we have got to, we've got to parse, we've got to part through all that stuff. And we have to get back to making sure that we have our unity together. And unity means that we are together. You can't be in unity with someone that you're never with. I'll say it again. You can't be in unity with someone you are never with. And many times in the Bible, what do we have? We have uh, one another passages. And here's a list of them, and I'm going to give them to you. I'll try to go slow so you can get them. But in John 13, 34, it says we're supposed to love one another. And I printed out those passages, and I think I left them on the copier. So I can't read them for you. Number two is be devoted. Be devoted to one another. Number three, we need to build up one another. Or one smother, if you look at another typographical error there. I did not have Linda proofread this one here, so these are all on me, not on, not on her or anybody else. Uh, admonish, Romans, Romans 15, 14, admonish one another. Sometimes we have to correct each other. Say, I don't know if that thinking's not quite right. Admonish, A-D-M-O-N-I-S-H. Galatians 5.13 says we should serve one another. To serve one another. That means we've got to find out what other people need, what other people want, and we, we, and we find those things and we do those things. Be kind. Ephesians 5.19. Be kind to one another. Colossians 3.13. Bear the burdens of one another bear each other's burdens how are you going to help somebody out if you're never around them you can't do it we have to be connected first thessalonians 4 18 comfort comfort one another and then the last the last one is encourage encourage one another So we're going to connect around purity. Our upward connection is purity with God. And then our unity is going to drive us, uh, drive us to connect with each other in the appropriate ways. And you can't want, can't want another if you're not around, around one another. And so we're going to do those, those couple things. We're also going to support the ministry of our church support the ministry of the church if we're going to be connected as the body of christ and we are actually going to look at the passage uh probably next week that talks about uh we are one body and many members but if we're going to be connected to each other we're going to have to support the ministry of the church again you can't you can't do these one another things if you are never together. If you sent me in the world, Jesus says, I've sent them into to the world. 
And in Ephesians, it says some to be pastors and teachers. And you, you, you think, that's not me. I'm not a pastor or teacher. But God sent pastors and teachers to do this, to prepare God's people, that's you, for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach all unity in faith and in knowledge and in the Son of God we become mature. So we have a unity in faith, we have a unity in knowledge, and we mature as we perform the functions we're designed for. And that builds up the body of Christ. So how are you, build, how are you currently building up the body of Christ? It's, it's rhetorical, don't ask answer out loud, but I do want you to think about it. How are you building up currently the body of Christ? Serving. And, that lo- that, and serving looks different for all of us. No, there's no cookie cutter way to do it. But how do we do that? We support the ministry by being who God has called us to be and raising ourselves up. I was just talking with with one of, one of the people here, and uh, I, I won't call her out in front of people. She would hate that. But uh, we were talking about the person that she was a few years back is not the person she is now. Amen. And I hope that's you. That you're, if you're a guy, I hope you're not just she. But I hope, I hope that you're the per, you're not the person you was if you, you were a few years back. As you get into the Word, it starts to change you. And the things you say, I could never do that. And next thing you know, you start doing those things. And so we support the ministry of the church by becoming who we need to be. And we do that by, here's some blanks to fill in, by attending faithfully. And, and, I, and I'm not telling you anything new and I'm not preaching, preaching to the people who probably need to hear this because you're here on a Sunday night. But we attend faithfully <clears throat> so that we can grow together, connect each other and support the ministry the purpose of the church let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching popular verse from hebrews and a very good verse we need to continue to be together does does the bulk of the great commission happen in church no it does not but we need to meet together to be encouraged and to gain strength from one another. There's a good illustration uh, that's been used for a long time. If you go out and you you actually have old-fashioned coals and you light them on fire, they all work in synergy together. And you pull one off and set it by itself, the rest of them will continue to stay warm and, and, and fulfill their purpose of being hot enough to cook food while the one, without the heat of the others will quickly fade away. And so when we come together, that's what it's about. It's about about receiving some fuel from the Lord. Mainly it's about worshiping Him first. But when we do that, we worship God. And as we give ourselves to God, He fills us up with the power of His Spirit to get the purpose done in life. Because He's changing us through His Word and through our obedience. Second, we need to give generously. Each man should give what he's decided to give in his heart, not reluctant. Or under compulsion because God loves a cheerful giver. So we need to be giving to that to that to the church. Now I, I don't I don't care how much you give. I don't care anything about that. But if if you're part of the church, you should be giving. But it means more than just your money. And we're we're not. It's, it's not. It's, it's like oh here it is. It's like like you had to sit through the three hours and now it's the spiel. It's not that. It's we have to give. Be we should be givers of the to the things that we think are important, and that includes. Um, your time and your effort and your, your discipleship being, your, your being a disciple while you're trying to make disciples. We support the church by discovering and developing my gifts and talents. Discovering and developing. Discovering and developing. How many of you guys have ever taken, let me see a show of hands, how many of you guys have ever taken a spiritual gifts inventory? All right, okay. That's, that's all, neither good nor bad, just, I just wonder. So I've taken several over my life. And anybody care to share with this what, what, you, what you discovered through taking that, that, that inventory, what, what they said or you think or you know that your spiritual gift is? Anybody care to share? 
What, what is your spiritual gift? Hospitality. Hospitality, okay. Hospitality from the hospitality people back there, all right. Encouragement, Encouragement. all right. That's a spiritual gift. Somebody else? Giving. Giving. Anybody else? So you may, maybe the first thing you need to do is discover what the spiritual gifts are. And there's not a, a, a particular ex- completely exhaustive list. But if, if mine is probably, and this is going to sound a little bit weird, my, mine is, is prophecy. And, and, it, and it, look, it doesn't look like the Old Testament prophet where you, you do weird stuff and you get out in front of people. But it's, it's, it's in counseling and and. And it's a, it's a spiritual gift, and it's been something that, that people have told me since I was like 15, 14, 15 years old. It's like, you're easy to talk to. I, I don't know why I'm telling you all this stuff. And then, you, then I remember Bible verses that apply, and it's like, I, where'd this come from? It's like, I mean, and you can, you, if you want to do, do what I do in that way, I can teach you some, but some of it's just a spiritual gift. It's just, just how you're wired up and how God made you. And so we need to discover what our spiritual gifts by making sure we're in the Word and, uh, and, and figure that out. But then we also need to develop whatever happens in our life so that we, we can get better at those things. So once you discover, once I discovered I was supposed to you know, do counseling, then I needed to go get some training for counseling. And uh, some of it was really bad. And it's like, That's, that doesn't work. And you find out what you do and you develop it and you try to get better and better at it. But as you, you discover it, you think sometimes that you, the way you're going to discover it is like you're going to open the Bible and God's going to go, oh, this is, this is my spiritual gift. But most people I know discover their spiritual gift when they try stuff. Opportunity comes up and it's like, who will do this and who will help us with that? And you're going, I don't know anything about that. But if you need help, I'll help you. And then you get in and you do that job and you learn one of two things. You learn, hey, this is where I need to be working. Or you learn, this is not where I need to be working. Right? Isn't am I right? Because you're saying, you know, you know, I could never teach kids. Have you tried it? Then you don't know. And then you try it and you go, this is for me. It's not for me. And then you back out and you find. But you have to discover what God has for you. And then you... You, it's not that you can't work outside of your spiritual gift, but your main work should be inside of that. Do not neg- neglect your gift, Timothy says, which was given you through a prophetic message. So we need to be developing, developing our, uh, our spiritual gifts and understanding who we are so that we can contribute, so that we can build up the church. You've got a place in the world, and I tell you where it is, it's building up the church. Bible says it. And if you want to try to, to fill that, that void in your life without finding and doing the things in the scripture, you're, you're, you're just going to miss out some. So when we do that, that's called ministry. And ministry is the function of the church. It's the function of being connected. It's the function of being a member of the body of Christ. And your function will change over time. Most of us start off, start off as a sponge. We start off as a sponge in almost everything in our life. We don't know anything. Somebody pours into us. We start soaking it up. And we go, man, this is cool. This is great. This is filling my life. And then we get full. And I'm challenging you to not think about the sponge, but to think about the pitcher. The big picture. A little play on words for you. Because you shouldn't be a sponge all your life. I mean, you should be soaking up the Word of God all your life, so that part, yes. But we need to be past, past that saying that I come to church to get fed. And you, you probably said this, and I've said it too. You come to church and you say, well, I just didn't get fed today. And you're, and you're, 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 spo- you're in the sponge mentality. I was like, oh, I just gotta, I just gotta soak it up, and nobody's pouring into me like they should be. And once you start maturing, you need to move from keep being the sponge in one aspect, but you need to start moving to looking for people 
to pour into. A, a, a river that doesn't have an outlet gets very stagnant. I got the, I got the privilege of floating in the, in the Dead Sea. And that's one that has no outlets. And what happens? It's a Dead Sea. And nothing grows in there. Microorganisms don't grow in there. You know, only things in there are a bunch of salt and people. And they can't even sink because there's so much salt in there. And we need to be the pitcher. And I'm not saying there's not time to be soaking it up. You may have an area of your life. You just really need to just be the learner for a while. That's good. But the maturity means as we mature, we're moving from the sponge to being the pit- pitcher. So we're going to connect. We're going to connect to God. We're going to connect with each other, each other. And then lastly, we're going to connect outwardly. Roman number four, I will share the testimony of my faith. I will share the testimony. Testimony. What do you think when you hear that term? Testimony. It's like place your hand on the Bible, go to the court, and then I'm going to tell the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And then you, you sit down and you share your, your sworn testimony. Or you think about it in churchy terms, it's like testimony is like, it's like what really spiritual people do. You know, they stand up and, oh, he's got a great testimony. And it's just so cool. But your testimony is just your story. And whether you're, whether you're in the courtroom putting your hand on a Bible or whether, whether you're, you're sharing a spiritual story, it's just a story. It's just what you've seen. It's just what you've done. It's what you know. And we need to be able to share our story Jesus said, I've sent them into the world. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. Jesus prays before he's gone away from us that other people will believe because of our message. And our message is just the simple gospel of Jesus and how it worked in our lives. We got to connect to other people to be able to share your story. I mean, yeah, you can go up on the... You can go up on the, on the street and on the beach and try to strike up a conversation. Not very many of us have had really great, uh, I don't know, outcomes with that. There's some people that are gifted, and they do that all the time. It's like, man, good for you. I've tried it and tried it and tried it, and it always comes up empty. And my, my gospel always it comes through relationships. And Jesus says here that it's through our message that we have to put it into words the gospel and how it applied to us. So how do others come? How do we share this testimony? How do we make this happen? By praying for those who will come to Christ. Jesus prayed for those who would come. And we need to be praying for specific individual people in light of the Great Commission. So here we are. We're looking at people and specifically befriending them, uh, investing in them. And it doesn't matter the outcome. We make real friendships with those people. If if they never come to church, we're still real friends. If they never come to the gospel, we still love them just the same. You don't spend a certain amount of time and you ditch people. We don't do that. But we do that. We have to be caring for them and pray for them. I urge then, first of all, that requests and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for everyone. So we got to be praying for the people. If we want to see the movement of God, we need to ask the Spirit of God to move. And second, by engaging and inviting by engaging and inviting. Let's back up to prayer for just a minute. Is when we, we talk to God on other people's behalf, that's prayer. But we also need to ask hard questions of ourselves. Lord, what do you want me to do in regards to this person? Because sometimes we just pray, God, I want you to save that person. And what, you, what we really want is we want somebody else to go do the work. Or we just want God to reach down and magically and, and wonderfully save them. I mean, he can do that. But we need to be asking the question of ourselves: As I pray for this person, Lord, what should I do? How can I serve them? How can I show them love? How can I spend my time and energy to let them feel loved? And then we are engaging, inviting to those people, both to the church and into our lives. And if you got to do one or the other first, I mean, you can do both at the same time, but if you had to weigh them out, invite them into your life first. 
I mean, it's okay to casually invite people to church, but if you're investing, inviting people into your life to sit down at the table with you, to share coffee with you, to, to go to a, a football game or a, a fishing event or whatever it is you do, you invite them into your life. And then out of that relationship, we invite them to church where we hopefully here will give them the word of God and we'll give them an action point and we'll give them a pondering point, at least, at least one of both of those. Here's something to really think hard about. Hmm. Here's something to do. I don't know if I will or not, but we strive to use the word in that way to engage and to try to uh, challenge people to respond and say yes to God. He's patient with you. He's not wanting any to perish, but bringing all to repentance, including your friends that you've been praying for and thinking about. And lastly here, you share your testimony by welcoming those who visit. Greet the brothers with a holy kiss. If you do that much, you won't have many brothers at the church because guys aren't really going to get into the holy kiss a whole lot. But what is that saying? It's saying with the, 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 the common greeting of the day, good handshake, warm smile, pat on the back, whatever's appropriate. We need to be welcoming people. One of the songs we sing is Welcome to the Island. We sang it this morning. Why do we sing that? It's kind of a little ditty. It's, it's a, does it really say much? Yeah, not, not a whole lot. It's not deep theological. But why do we sing it? Because we want our, want our people to continue to think we need to be saying welcome. Welcome to the island. Welcome to the church. Welcome to my life. I should do it at the first service? No. Yeah. Maybe we should change up our strategy there and, and start doing those more purposeful ones at the early service. Because people want to be welcomed. But again, they're not looking just for friendliness. People are looking for friends. And that takes time. And we've got people coming to this church right now who've been coming recently. I hope you've been looking around. I hope you're seeing them. I hope you're getting their names. But we got like four, five, six, seven, eight couples I can think of and several individuals who are connected enough with our church that they're on the outside. They've been coming for two, three, four weeks, some of them for a couple of months. And they're, you know, and we can't do all the work for them. We can't, you can't make them connect, be connect but you can let them know we're here. And at first, most, if you're, most people, I think at first, they're not, not all, but most people are like, you're welcoming. And they're like, I, you know, when are you going to get the snakes out? You, when are you going to start handling snakes? It's like, you know, how weird are you guys? It's like, I mean, it, we, we laugh, but let's be honest. Like, hey, you know, yeah, I went to that church for five weeks and boom, this happened. I'm out. Anybody ever had that happen to you? you anybody real? Okay. I, I remember the first time I went to a, a church and a friend invited me and invited me, invited me. And finally I go and it's like, hey, he's a good guy. These people seem to be great. And all of a sudden it was just weirdness everywhere for me. And uh, it's like, ooh, I'm slipping out the back door and I'm not coming back. So when we welcome people, it's going to take them some time. But we have to continue to welcome people. We have to continue to invite things. It's not like I invited them, check mark. They didn't come. Okay, I'm off the hook. No, no, it's a process. It's a process to get from here to here in a spiritual journey. But it's also a process to get from here into somebody's life. Because most of us aren't really open. And you've got to earn your way in there by being the person that God wants you to be. So be a friend. Induce, introduce people by name. Learn their names. I'm not good at it. I'm working at it. Get to know people. One of the very best ways to introduce the woman to this church is Women's Night Out. Without that, I would have never come back again. There you go. Because I was ignored for three weeks in a row. But Women's Night Out changed my life. You got, you, you, you got connected. You got connected and yeah. And and I have I have stories of good like then I have stories equally of people who have been left out and, and I'm deeply sorry and I'm as much a part of that as anybody. It's like it's hard to see everybody, but that's no excuse for us not to see people. And uh, we need to keep keep going and keep inviting and I'm glad you persisted. I'm glad you didn't fall off. And so if we're gonna be a connecting place and that's what I hope we're gonna be, then we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to do that on purpose. And uh, that is part of the Great Commission. You can't, 
you can't minister to people if you don't connect to them. At the bottom, we talked about all this connecting. If you want to officially connect with the church, and this is not a targeted thing, but if you're not a member of the church, you know what, and you've been here, you already know what it takes to be a member of the church. You receive Christ as your Lord, you've been baptized, and you want to come alongside of us, then we're glad to do that. I actually brought some membership cards up here. I'm not going to pass them out. I'm not going to put them in your face. But if you say, you know what, I am finally ready to join. You just got to fill our card out. We'll present you at one of our services, and that could happen. We hope that'll happen. Uh, and everybody in this room, I already feel like we're, you're a part of us. Uh, some of you may not be officially part, and we invite you to do that. Any questions real quickly before we wrap up? All right. I don't no normally take questions because I might not have answers. Pray with me, and we'll, we'll call it a night. God, we thank you that, that you have called us to connect with others. And Lord, we just thank you that you made the ultimate effort and paid the ultimate price to connect with us. When we were dead in sins, when we had no way to get to you, you sent your son who died to take away our sins so we could be pure and we could grab hold of that promise of heaven and we could have a relationship with you. Help us to share that in joy and excitement and help us to uh, keep you constantly in our minds and our lips. We give you praise for who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name, I pray it. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.